Hello, everybody. Goodness. You're welcome. Mm. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm so happy to see that there's so many here, bright and early. Uh, I'm Helena Bengtsson, and this is Jennifer Lafleur, and we're going to talk to you about what we do when we can't ask for a pretty data set from our authorities or uh, agencies, but what we do when there is no data and we want to create it ourselves. So just to give you an idea of who I am, I am uh, the data editor for uh, 13 or 12 local papers in Sweden. Uh, and Sweden is here, for people who didn't know where Sweden was. Uh, <laughs> So uh, these are all my papers that I work for and uh, the reporters there. And uh, they're not my papers, of course. Uh, I just call them that. So one of the things that I've been doing more and more, I think, is because one reason, the reason, of course, sometimes you need to create your own data because you can't, don't have access to data. And that could be the situation for most people in this room or for people who come from other. I come from Sweden. We have great access to documents and data, but it's not always the right kind and it's not always in the right format. So uh, I've been more and more actually working on sort of creating my own databases. And there are a couple of advantages for that. And one of them is that it's your data. It's your exclusive data. And since it's exclusive, it also means that nobody else is chasing you. So you can take your time. And I work with local reporters, local reporters who have to file maybe two, three stories a day sometimes. They don't have time to take two weeks to publish something exactly at that time because otherwise they will be beaten by the competition. But they can take their time. They can work in their the little spare time that they have and whenever they're ready to publish, we publish. Uh, so you have an exclusive data but you also don't have the pressure of you know, a deadline in the same way. So that's why I really like doing this. So this is one of my, the smallest paper that I work with. They only publish, they only go to print three days a week. And there's only about eight or nine people in their newsroom. They cover one town and the surrounding, surrounding areas for that. And one of the reporters called me and she said, we've been hearing so much about drugs in our little town, much, much more than we've been hearing before. There's lots and lots of drugs. Why? But I want to do this in a quantify. I just don't want to do the sort of talk on the town story. I want to see if I can verify this in some way. And I said, it's kind of tricky because you don't have a court in your town. So how do we do it? And we together we figured out a way to look at, find paper records that where the person who was sentenced actually lived in the area. So we could find records of this is all court records from Sweden, and the persons are um, have been sentenced for a small or a larger d drug crime, and they live in her area. So she got all the PDFs from me, and she sat down and she, at her time, at her spare time, just as I ta talked about, uh, oh, I just lost the thingy. This is my technician, Jennifer. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> what is it doing? Just. That is very weird. It only. I am in PowerPoint. Is there now? No. No, it's gone. Okay. It's there now, but I don't no, know. No, no we're not going to move. We're we're going to you're going to have to have that little thing on the end. I'm sorry about that, but it'll go, it'll go away. Yeah. So she sat down with a spreadsheet and she started to type in and now it, it's all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh hopefully this will work or not. She sat down with the spreadsheet and the PDF and she started to entering in what the name of the person was, if they were a man or a woman, what date they were sentenced, 
uh, where, because in the, in the court record it also said where, the, where they had caught the person, where, they had, where the crime has been committed. And they also talked about, and you can't see it, but actually they talked about the substances uh, that they had been caught with. What is, was it cannabis? Was it pills? Whatever it was. Now there's the big smile. Oh, so it doesn't... Okay, yeah. So she ended up doing this story, which is sort of, this is how the drugs are sold on the streets of Ulrisaham, which is her little town. And out of that data set, she got, you know, the map of where the crime had been committed. She got a little graph on what kind of substances there are. Uh, she got, of course, because she also had all the people in the data set, she got people to interview. Of course, they didn't want to, show their faces, but she still could get an interview with this guy who was selling drugs because he was a drug addict himself. She got an interview with a woman who was one of the few women who had been sentenced for this, and she also got this story about the a bigger crime uh, within her town. So out of that, she could do sort of a number of angles out of her own data. Uh, so I was then bragging about her to everyone on my, in my papers and in conferences, actually, she's very proud that I'm, that little paper has now been also in the international conference. Good morning. So I went down, to, they are the, my most Northern paper. So I went down to my most Southern paper and immediately the crimes reporter that said, can we do the same thing here? The problem is that that's a much bigger paper, relatively speaking, but they're still all small, but they're much bigger than that. And she wanted to do all, she wanted to do sort of heavy crime in Ystad, which is her town. And if anybody of you have seen Valander, that's where Valander comes from. So there's a lot of crimes in Ystad, you would know that, because they even make a crime series out of it. So yes, I said we can do it, but it'll be a lot of records. And neither you nor I have the time to type in 600 records into a spreadsheet. So that's when I started to sort of see uh, the other ways of doing it. So all the Swedish court records look the same. They have sort of a date, they have a docket number, they have a person, they have a, and so on. So I could, by Googling a lot, put together a little script that actually drew out the information from the PDFs. And we ended up having a, a database of about 600 uh, crimes. And the great thing about that, again, was that we could choose what angles to do. We could find all the different, this is a harbor town, so there's lots of smuggling there. Uh, there's, of course, lots of drugs because there's every, there, they are everywhere. We found domestic abuse and so on. Uh, so we could do all these different stories. There were a lot of drunk driving in there and so on. So we could do all these stories. And because we had the data, but we also had the local knowledge of the reporter, we could sort of pair up and do the story. She has great contacts, great sources within sort of that local community. I have no clue. I haven't heard. Yeah. No, in in my case, I needed some coding. Maybe you can use, there are tons of different scraping tools and there could be a tool that could do exactly that. I haven't heard of that tool, but I'm sure it, you know, I'm sure it could do that, yeah. Uh, we're gonna go to another, actually from the smallest paper that I've ever worked on to the largest paper I've ever worked on, which is The Guardian. Uh, and we had a weekly planning meeting uh, at The Guardian when I was there and Actually, journalism happened at the weekly planning meeting. Journalism never happens in the weekly planning meeting, but this time it did. So the business editor said, all of a sudden we were going around the room, what are you doing this week, the, editor, the, uh, the news editor said. And the business editor said, she, she said that, we've heard, and this is 
pre-Brexit. We have to think about that. This is pre-Brexit. I don't know how relevant it is today. But she said, we've heard that there are lots and lots of plans of building more luxury apartments. But they and th those are apartments not really meant for people to live in, just for people to invest in. And we would really want to do that story, but don't really know how we should do it. And then some other person at the meeting said, actually, my... My dentist just moved in in one of those towers that that hosts that houses all those apartments, and he said that it's like a ghost building. There's nobody living there. It's all dark. I walk around when I come home from work. There's just sort of echoes of emptiness in that building. So the editor then looked at me sternly, and he said, why don't you take a look at this? And I said, yes, sir, because that's what you did at The Guardian. Uh, so <laughs> we got the, uh, again, paper records from who owned the apartments. We chose one. We chose actually chose the Vauxhall Tower, which was the tower where the dentist lived. And we got the paper records. And paper records is, you know, a lot, a lot of text, but I think it's three pages of uh, uh, a, reg a title register, but the only thing that really matters is these about 10 lines. It starts with title absolute, and then it says who bought the place, where do they live, and what did they pay. Sort of that is what's important in all those, for me at least. So I could then, and this is another programming language, is just show that you don't really need a lot of, this is a script that I once stole from a, very famous data journalist at the New York Times, and then I've used that for many, many years, the same script, I just put in a different URL into the script and then it runs. And it just basically looks for a keyword like title absolute, and then it downloads 10 rows from that. And I could then make a data file of all the apartments and all the people that live there. And on this side, I worked. So I worked on finding out where were they from, how many of them were from uh, tax havens, uh, and so on, and other things. And on the other side of the spreadsheet, which is a slide I apparently forgot to put in there, the reporter worked, and he looked, he did, you know, reporting. He took the names, he did research on the people, he went down to the building, somebody let him in, probably the dentist, but we're not saying that. Uh, and he walked around and he met somebody in a hallway and he talked about them. So he did reporting and together we did this story. And the great thing about this story, I also think, is that it has its, the foundation is data, but the data resides here. We didn't do it as a data story. The story doesn't start with, there are 214 apartments in the Vauxhall Tower. 95% of them don't have a owner that is registered to vote. We didn't do that kind of story. We put the data there, and he told the story about people who were had bought the apartments. Uh, another example from The Guardian is uh, at Panama Papers. Oh, no, it's working. Behave. Uh, from the Panama Papers, and people at ICIJ don't really like when I say that Panama Papers wasn't actually a great data story. It was a great, great, great story, or great, great, great lots of stories, but the data was actually piles and piles of papers everywhere. So what you could do was actually more the fishing method, which is that you baited your fishing rod with a name, like Cameron, you put the fishing rod out, if you were lucky, you got documents back that said David Cameron's father has a, found, has a trust in a tax haven, and you can do a story about that. Well, I like data. I like structure. So we found these letters where the, on British Virgin Islands, if a company who was registered with the, with the company the way the leak came from, uh, was in some kind of legal or tax trouble, they would they are obligated by law to give out who's the beneficial owner. So we found all these letters where uh, they they asked the company to to give them the beneficial owner, and in this case they say we were unable to retrieve 
the bulk beneficial owner. In this case, they say the beneficial owner of the company is not known to us. In this case, they say the beneficial owner of the company is Allah Muhammad Hosni Mubarak. He wasn't exactly a person that was allowed to have companies at that time. He was on every sanctions list there was. So I took these, and I think that now I would probably try to maybe write a script, but I actually typed them in. So I typed all the information from the letters into a spreadsheet and spent a couple of weeks doing that and also typed in the dates when they were supposed to answer this spreadsheet, the answer the, the letter and so on, and if they were able to give the information of the beneficial owner or not, and so on. And we did the story about how the authorities at Brit British Virgin Island... Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> it's probably good for you. <laughs> And I'm always imagining that the officials who never did anything against Mossack uh, Fonseca, they were really just sitting on that beach and drinking some kind of cocktail instead of doing the, what they were supposed to do. Uh, let's do this from... Yeah, it, do, it does. Go back home. This is an interesting project where we... We had an election in Sweden last year, and... One of the papers were super ambitious. So they let all their local reporters, they have about, they cover about eight or nine local uh, councils around uh, their area. And each local, and they have a local office in each of those. And the local reporters there, they did interviews with party representatives for each of the parties. And in Sweden, we have lots of parties. So each local reporter had done five or six interviews. So we had like 80 or 90 interviews that were all structured in the same way. So, <laughs> so they called me up and said, we've done all these interviews. Can we, what, can we do something data-ish with them? Sort of, and that was sort of a nice challenge that I couldn't. So this is actually data made from articles. You know, data made from articles that were already published by one of the papers. And I sort of tried to gather all the text. And once I had gathered all the text, I started counting what words they were using. And we could then see that if we looked at, for instance, the, uh, let's see what we should say. We should look at the Christian Democrats. They talked a lot about care for the elderly. If we look at the Environmental Party, talked about the environment, of course, but also about children. Uh, and so on. So I could sort of pinpoint words that were much more common within certain parties, and we could sort of compare them together. So it was a really sort of, it was an interesting project. I don't think it actually went that well, but it sort of, it was, it le I learned a lot and it was fun to do. Uh, my final example, I've showed you a lot of things that is from documents, and there's probably a couple of people out there thinking, Oh, but she has great documents. I don't have those documents in my country. Well, sometimes you can also create data just from people. Uh, so this is another election project. This is six years ago at Swedish television. And we wanted to look specifically at the areas around the big cities in Sweden where there's lots of crime, there's lots of people living there who doesn't have a lot of employment, uh, lots of people with ad other backgrounds and so on. And we wanted to, you know, look at them, but not do it in the way that we usually do. You're very welcome to come if you wanted to. <laughs> I think there is some room in the back. Okay, no. Mm. Uh, so... An editor of mine suggested that we would send a team out, a, a reporting team, to each of these areas. And they are actually, the police has actually designated 23 areas in Sweden that are specifically labeled as pr troublesome areas, sort of. Uh, and I said, well, if we're going to send a team out there, why don't they, you know, ask the same questions? And he said, oh, you can't put restrictions on the team like that. And I said, it's not restrictions. They can do whatever they want. I just want them to ask a few questions that are the same, no matter what they go. So we set up this little form. It's a Google form. And this is not for the people in the areas. This is actually for the reporters to fill in. So the reporter has to fill in 
And we came up with the idea to talk to small business owners in those areas, pizzeria owners, uh, you know, corner store owners, and so on. And we then asked them, did they, how did they, what was their experience of the neighborhood, and were they, had they been victim, of, had there, has there been any crime in their store for the last uh, couple of years? Uh, so because the reporters filled this in, we got it back in a spreadsheet format. And that was the good thing about it. Instead of them coming back and just writing a report, I actually forced them to do this form and they you know, complained a little bit and then they did it anyway, which was good. Uh, and from that form, we could, do, we could do a main story for the national news that was sort of two out of three small business owners in those areas had reported that they, there had been some kind of crime in their, in their store or in their uh, company. But we also got, of course, a visualization out of that where we could say, where we could show the different kinds of crime, how many of them have, had been victim for that. But we also got a story about this guy who had tried to run businesses in several places outside Stockholm, and he now decided to quit doing that because there was so much damage done to his stores. He had been threatened. He'd been sent to... They'd been beating him, and he had to go to hospital and so on. So, yeah, no, no, it worked. Uh, and we could sort of do a story about this. So from all this data, we could both have sort of the, the number story, but also, also this person. And when I came to the papers, I actually wanted to use this. So we did one project where we, just as the restrictions from the pandemic were lifting, we asked our readers for, how do you feel? Two years with COVID, how are you doing? And this is a very, this was something I do actually with the features editor. So, and she usually writes portraits about, you know, people who just had their kids or people who turned 50, that sort of thing. But it's a very interesting project because they're all soft values. But because we're doing it in a structured format, it actually becomes data and we can sort of use it for our stories. So, and we also get a lot of case studies. So we could then tell the story about Ellen 19, who's been spending her whole, the last two years beside a screen, you know, trying to go through school. Uh, this is a, an amazing story where this guy was, had to work from home, home, of course, and he thought, if I'm gonna work from home, I can just as well, you know, move back home where, my, where I used to live. It's cheaper to live there. So he got an apartment in, you know, in this rural area, and his next door neighbor was also working from home. And then at the end of the pandemic, they were just not yet neighbors. They also were a family. So from sort of from doing that. So that was a great story we got out of this project. And we had done this for, we did this for more hard hitting questions. So before the election in another little town, we again sent out reporters, but they had the same questions with them. So they sort of asked them, what is important for you for the election? And they had a database that they could go sort of back into all the way up covering the election. And it's just sort of, and I know that this is not in any way scientific. It's not a scientific selection. We have to be very careful when we use it. We always tell them that it's not a scientific selection. We haven't randomly, you know, made a random selection. But the reporters who were going out, for instance, in this town were very sort of instructed that, don't talk to just, you know, white women who are, you know, dragging their, they have to walk, talk to everybody. So, and we are very clear with what we're doing there. And the last example of that is one that we did very recently that got really successful, where we, where we asked the same questions to two different groups. So in Sweden, almost every child goes to preschool and the preschool is, a state-funded preschool. So it, there is a fee, but it's not very high. So we made a questionnaire where the first question is, are you working at a preschool or are you a parent? And then the survey went into two sides. So the, the preschool teachers got one set of questions and the parents got you know, another set of questions, but some of the questions were the same. And we could then, and the, the big thing we found out was that 
all the parents are super happy. Not all the parents are not super happy, but most parents are very satisfied or some or satisfied with their preschool. They think it's great. The ch- my children loves it. I love the staff there. They're lovely, blah, blah, blah. And then we asked the staff and the staff said, I cry when I drive home from work every night. I'm so exhausted. The groups are too big. I have so much pressure and so on. So the same kind of reality through two eyes. And not surprisingly, the preschoolers that we then called up, we asked them to give their contact information. We don't force them to do that. We, it's, it's not necessary, but we say, could you please give your contact information? Some of them do, but when we called up the preschooler teachers, they all said, no, no, I don't dare to talk about this. No, I don't want to talk about this. But we could use their quotes. We were clear with that we could use their quotes. So we used their quotes all through the coverage, and we used experts to sort of talk about, including one future expert that talked about how parents and the generation today is so distanced from society that they don't think they're a part of society. They think that society is there for them, but they are not really participating in it. And it was really interesting when we could raise it to this level. So that was my part. I'm now going to hand the mic over to to Jennifer. My name's Jennifer LaFleur. I'm um, just leaving a position as senior editor at the Center for Public Integrity, staying on as a contributing editor, but now I'm um, going to be teaching data journalism at UC Berkeley in California. Um, so Helena gave great examples from how they actually apply um, this stuff, so I'm going to skip around on a couple of things. But this is basically the list of the ways <coughs> that we've built data from, you know, building data from documents, surveys and polls, crowdsourcing, scraping, um, physical surveys, sampling, testing, and satellites. Um, and at the end, if you guys have any more suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Um, so gathering your own data, Helena talked about this a little bit, but the pitfalls is it does take more time and more effort. You have to make sure that your data that you're building is accurate. Um, willy, no willy-nilly data. Um, you have to be consistent how you're building it. The benefits are, as Helena said, you're doing a totally original story that nobody else can do, and you have control over how you do it. Um, so this is a ProPublica and Palm Beach Post in Florida story. They um, wanted to look at the smoke that comes um, into the communities when they build, they uh, burn sugarcane fields in Florida. And to do that, they worked with scientists to figure out what kind of testers they might need to test the air. And they worked with scientists to figure out where to put those. And so this was um, gathering air testing data, putting it in a database to see how bad the air was and where it was the worst and at what times. Um, this was the Marshall Project. Can you stand up? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I've never had this happen. Um, during COVID, they wanted to look at COVID cases in prisons by state. And so what they did is they deputized everybody in the newsroom. Everybody in the newsroom had like one or two states, and their job was to go to call the state to get the information to build it. So they were kind of crowdsourcing it in the newsroom so they could keep this up with all the cases in um, prisons. I don't know. Um, this is one of my favorite stories, and it's a few years old, but I, I love this example. So um, La Nacion in um, Buenos Aires was given notebooks from a driver who drove officials around, and um, he took detailed notes of where they went to collect bags of money or bribes um, from companies that had been awarded public contracts. Um, and I love that they animated the little notebook. Um, after the story, 73 people were prosecuted, including a former president, 40 were imprisoned, and another 40 confessed their crime. So it had a lot of impact. And they took the data that was in these notebooks and put it in rows and columns in a spreadsheet. <laughs> That's amazing. I think something somewhere is loose, so. Okay. I don't normally have this problem, so maybe it's. Okay, 
So um, when you're collecting data, remember to leave time. It's going to take more time than you think it will. Um, if you've built a database, set a cutoff date. Like we're going to say we're going to gather everything up to March 1st. We're not going to gather any records off of that. Um, use verification or double entry. Um, what that means is like don't just have the intern enter all the records and assume that it's okay. Have somebody else go behind and make sure that they're okay. Um, do some spot checking or ground truth. So if it's something where you can actually physically go observe, go look at it. Um, and let the data guide your reporting, which is something we always do. So surveys and polls, um, some best practices to think about whether you're doing your own survey or poll or covering someone else's. Um, know the universe and what subgroups you might want to do analysis on. Um, because if you just are looking at a group, then you're going to need, you won't need as big a sample size as if you're looking at subgroups. You'll need to have bigger samples so that you can look at subgroups. Avoid leading questions. Avoid too many open-ended questions because they will be a nightmare to deal with when you're trying to analyze it. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit more about sampling in a bit. And test your questions with a small group before you launch your survey. Just make sure there's things that um, people don't misunderstand or it's just a good, good way to test everything first before you launch anything. Um, so crowdsourcing, this is, I thought this was an interesting example. It's a project to look at mental health and their crowdsourcing videos um, of people's stories, which is a little different than normally d normal data gathering. Um, this was, um, <laughs> this was a project that took um, 40,000 intercepted audio recordings and built data from that. Um, Scraping, we talked about that a little bit. Some examples. Some examples of scraping. Um, this is a project uh, Public Integrity does called Copy Paste Legislate, where it, we, they scrape, we scrape um, legislation so that you can look across the country and see similar legislation that's being put forth in states and see the patterns of, um, of people who are just like using each other's or using um, interest groups proposed legislation. Um, this is a project we did when I was at um, the Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, we scraped missing persons and unidentified people databases to build a tool so that people could try to make matches and find, um, basically identify people who are missing. Um, what happens in the US is that um, law enforcement agencies don't talk to each other. And so there's lots of cases where somebody goes missing but their body is found in a different county next door. But because they don't talk to each other, it's not found. And so this tool identified, I think, about a thousand possible matches of people who um, could be identified, could give their families closure. Um, so it was a really um, interesting and powerful tool. Um, this is another one I just found, um, Star Wars. They, they scraped thousands of fake reviews on Google. Um, and I don't know the whole like algorithm of how they figured out they were um, fake reviews, but um, it's kind of a fun example. Um, data entry. So again, if you're going to do reporter entry or double entry, make sure you double enter or use verification. Um, it's really easy to make mistakes. Um, you can use a data entry firm. A lot of newsrooms don't have the funding for that. Uh, but if you do that, do verification as well. And then there's task companies like Mechanical Turk, um, if you're OK with like t tiny children not making very much money entering your data. Um, and then that, you can also build in verification to the process. I'm kidding. I don't know that they use tiny children. They do pay poor, very poorly, though. <laughs> um, scanning and scraping documents. Um, you need to have good quality documents, but I think the tools and the algorithms for processing documents are getting so much better. I'll show you an example that. I would think it would be almost impossible to process, but we've been able to do that. Um, do physical spot checks of your results. And then if there's data, like numbers in your, in, your, um, in your records, you can check totals and check counts to see if your data is coming out correctly. Uh, Pandora Papers, another example of just a whole trove of both databases and documents. Um, this is a really old example, but I love this one because 
uh, there was a lot of, um, of documents dumped in a lake, and they sent divers down um, and gathered the documents, dried them, and then entered them. Um, and then this is a jury project that In the Dark, um, a radio podcast did, because they wanted to look at jury selection, and they in entered something like 10,000 documents to show bias in the jury selection there. Um, so machine learning for big complicated tasks, we're not going to teach that, but I just want to make you aware that there's a lot of great models out there that really can help you do amazing work. Find an existing model rather than create one. Um, it's probably the best plan. Um, you may need some human handwork to develop training data. What that means is you tell the, the model, like, we've entered this by hand, this is what it says, and use that for it to then develop um, develop a way of identifying the data. So, and develop a system for checking, um, just so you can go back check and make sure that it's not just all automated and it's doing it correctly. Um, whether that's like doing every nth record or another system for just making sure it's doing the right thing. Um, we have a project right now where we have nearly five million documents that look like this. Um, and believe it or not, there are machine learning algorithms that process it really well. We have physical people transcribers who are expert at transcribing this stuff, but then we use that information we get from them to apply to the algorithm, and um, it's, it's been amazing to get us the information that we need. Just remember data is not always just rows and columns. It could be food, it could be um, voting, it could be traffic. So when you're thinking about, I think uh, when we start out, we think of data as just like spreadsheets, but data is all around us. Like data is the elevator, like, elevator inspections and all kinds of things. The food quality, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and then you can build data from research or observation. Um, you just need to develop a methodology that is based on best practices and vet your methodology with experts. There are people who study all the things that we want to report about and they're really helpful and often um, can give you great guidance for how to do your um, analysis. Many years ago, I had a actually a, a student who I went to journalism school together with. When he started his first job, he drove by the local golf club, and he know he started noticing that the same cars were there. He started noticing that on Friday afternoon the same cars were there, and then he realized that those cars were also. He took started taking note of the numbers of them, and then he went to the local council, and they were the official the council officials were there. And on the parking lot, and the same, he found the same cars there. This was just sort of taking a structured approach, <coughs> gathering data that he believed would be data, and finding out that all the officials never worked on Fridays because they worked in the golf club. Oh, that's a great example. Okay. Okay, this is a project that. Um, uh, several organizations did together in Puerto Rico looking at the um, people who died after Hurricane Maria. Official no numbers were much lower than they actually were, so they were we went on the ground and did reporting to build a much more accurate database of the number of people that were killed in that hurricane. Um, I've used uh, random samplings of polling places, transit routes, to look at accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, and there's experts that I used to like help me build my testing. So um, there are models for that. So when you sample, you can draw a sample of documents or observations, but you kind of need to have an underlying universe. So um, let's say I was going to go look at all the polling places and see if they're accessible. My universe would be all the polling places, and I might need to pick you know, 400 or 500 of the polling places. Um, how I draw the sample, you want, usually you want a random sample. Um, I had an editor once who said, well, we don't want people to think that we just pulled this out of a hat. And I'm like, actually, we do. Um, <laughs> um, how will you get the items, docs or data? Um, figure out a plan. Um, how far do you want to break it down? So if you want to look at lots of different groups, you may need a bigger sample. And how accurate do you need to be? Because samples always have a margin of error, like 500, a sample of 500 is about plus or minus four percentage points. So just keep that in mind. 
Um, some examples from similar projects I've seen, databases built from murders from news articles, physically checking work sites, bridges, dams, and about anything else. Um, up to pull a random sample, every item has to have an equal chance of being included. So there's a function in, in Excel called the RAND function, but in R there's a random function. So you can do it in whatever program you'd like to use and pull it out. So I was doing something where I needed to pull a whole bunch of court records. Um, I didn't have the database of the court records themselves, but they told me at the courthouse that the records were numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I created <laughs> a database of all of the items based on numbers and then pulled my random sample and got those court records um, from just generating a list of numbers. Um, a systematic sample is where you pull every nth record. Usually you want to randomly pick the first one. Um, not to just start with the first record. A stratified sample is a sample where you're pulling it based in un, on an underlying number. So rather than pulling all the records for four cities um, in a pot and pulling randomly, you do a different random sample for each county or each city. Um, oversampling, sometimes you want to pull out a subgroup of your data and so you actually oversample those um, so that you can do research on that group. And then you can weight them down um, later so that they are evenly considered in the whole group. Um, examples of some projects I've done using sampling. Um, when I was at ProPublica, we did a project looking at um, racial bias in presidential pardons. Um, there were like 5,000 people who were denied pardons and another 1,000 people who were granted pardons, but we knew we couldn't get all the records for 6,000 people. So we built a random sample of all of the pardons and those that were denied pardons and um, pulled a random sample of 500 and did deeper research on each of those people in each of those cases. Um, so not scientific surveys and you talked a little bit about some of those which are, are fun and great to do. You just need to disclose that it's not a scientific survey. Web polls, radio, TV, call-in polls, man or woman on the street, Sweden's Got Talent, American Idol, America's got talent. <laughs> Even for a good cause, just check the methodology. Especially if you're reporting on somebody else's survey, make sure you can get the methodology. Check with experts. Um, I don't know, I've had like so many people who are like experts on a certain topic be incredibly generous with their time and help me through lots of work. I did a project looking at um, racial bias and jury selection in Dallas, Texas, and the three people who are most expert on the topic helped me with everything. They talked through it with me. They talked through methodologies. Um, they looked at my findings, um, and it was incredibly valuable. Um, I couldn't have done that project without that help, so don't ignore academics who are expert in certain areas. Um, make sure the actual data doesn't exist before you go to the trouble of creating it. Um, I have seen that happen. Um, sampling also is a good way to test a theory before you dive into a massive records hunt. So, you know, pull a sample of 20 or 50 or 100 to just check that your theory is actually holding up. Um, and then double check your analysis. So if you're doing analysis on a big database, you should be able to pull a random sample out of your data and get roughly the same results that you would from the whole thing. Um, using tests or sensors to gather data. Um, ProPublica did the air test for the um, smoke in the sugar fields. Um, this is another project that um, Yvette Cabrera did looking at um, lead testing in soil in Orange County, California. This one actually was a Sigma winner this year. Um, and she went and got, she worked with scientists to do the proper soil testing and then gathered soil tests for an area to just show just how bad the lead was in soil in her area. Similarly, the Philadelphia Inquirer did testing in schools that had all kinds of toxins and lead, and they actually deputized people within the schools, teachers and employees, to do some of the testing for them, and they had a strict methodology that everybody followed. Um, satellites. Satellite data can be really valuable for things like patterns of pollution, um, habitat, isolated remote communities, development that you wouldn't be able to know about any other way. 
Um, we've used it for drought and inequality. Um, lots of ways that the data that comes from satellites can be really valuable, especially if you're somewhere where you might not have regular data. The satellites are everywhere <laughs> looking at every part of the Earth, so it can be really powerful. Um, a couple of examples. This is a Buzz BuzzFeed story looking at the Chinese camps for Uyghurs um, using satellite data. Um, this is one we did at Reveal looking for um, the biggest water users in the state. So the state would not disclose the names of people who are the biggest water users. They would tell you like the area that they were in, but they would not name them. And so one of the reporters used satellite data to identify the likely um, biggest water users in the state because satellite data, when you get it, has measures like wetness and greenness and things like that that you can actually use to then identify conditions on the ground. Uh, we also used it a lot to track fire and how fire spread. Um, really valuable for that and just to understand how, how fires, um, we called it how fire feeds, so we could understand how the fires uh, work in our area. Um, and again, find the right methodology, read research reports, find an existing model, find experts. They're super valuable. Um, make sure you do spot checks or duplicate your work. Keep detailed notes so you can explain what you did in your methodology. Um, and if you're doing a survey or poll, test run it on a few people before a full launch. Um, balance your methodology off experts. Um, I've had a couple of projects where we actually did like, a, it was a statistical analysis, so we did a white paper explaining what we did, and then we sent that around to like 20 experts to vet our analysis, um, and it always made the story stronger. Disclose the details of your methodology, and never draw conclusions about a whole group unless you've got all or most all to answer. Um, so there's the presentation. Thank you.